you're listening to Radio Maria, Christian Voice in Your Home. We're now presenting the show, Jesus the Promised Messiah, with Roy Shulman. Hi, this is Roy Shulman, and welcome again to Jesus the Promised Messiah of Judaism, the show on Radio Maria that celebrates the Jewish roots of the Catholic Church, or seen the other way around, that celebrates the fulfillment, the completion, the full realization of the promise of Judaism in the Catholic Church and her sacraments. Well, we're almost always at a very special point in the year, um, especially when I include the Jewish and the Catholic calendars. But today, I want to reflect a little bit on where we are in the Catholic calendar. And in particular, this has been an extraordinary uh, week of feast days. Uh, today itself is the Feast of St. Bruno, and yesterday was the Feast of St. Faustina. Of course, earlier in the week, we had the Feast of St. Francis and the uh, Feast of St. Therese of Lisieux and the Feast of the Guardian Angels. So it really was a kind of a, a full house of feast days. But I want to uh, reflect on the on St. Faustina in her honor for her feast day yesterday and on St. Bruno in his honor for his feast day today, uh, both of which have uh, connections with either the conversion of the Jews or... Uh, frankly, my, my personal conversion. So I thought I'd take them in kind of chronological order and begin with a little reflection on St. Faustina. Um, needless to say, or I shouldn't say needless to say, but um, uh, she's a very large factor in my own spiritual life. I hardly encourage anyone who hasn't done so to read um, the diary of St. Faustina. And... Um, uh, it's maybe a little bit overwhelming. I think it's probably about 900 pages. But the way that I like to read it is just to keep it by my bedside and read a few pages every night before going to sleep. And uh, it's always very inspirational. Very much of it is, is the words of Jesus. Uh, but they're also um, insights into the meaning of life and the spiritual life that come from St. Faustina's own reflections in her diary. And it's one of those that I want to read today. It's paragraph 916, and it is about the conversion, the baptism, I should say, of a Jewish woman. And we learn a lot from this account. Uh, I'll first simply read the account, and then I will reflect a little bit on all that it tells us. And um, before I read the account, perhaps I will, will preface it by saying that in somewhat similar circumstances, I had the very, very good fortune, is not the right word, the great grace of being able to baptize both my parents individually when they were on their deathbed, so to speak. And the account in St. Faustina's diary is an account of just such a baptism of a, of a Jewish woman. So reading paragraph 916, this day is so special for me, even though I encountered so many sufferings, my soul is overflowing with great joy. In a private room next to mine, uh, St. Faustina was in the hospital at this point in time, in a private room next to mine, there was a Jewish woman who was seriously ill. I went to see her three days ago and was deeply pained at the thought that she would soon die without having her soul cleansed by the grace of baptism. I had an understanding with her nurse, a religious sister, that when her last moment would be approaching, she would baptize her. There was this difficulty, however, that there were always some Jewish people with her. However, I felt inspired to pray before the image which Jesus had instructed me to have painted. I have a leaflet with the image of the Divine Mercy on the cover, and I said to the Lord, Jesus, you yourself told me that you would grant many graces through this image. I ask you then for the grace of holy baptism for this Jewish lady. It makes no difference who will baptize her, as long as she is baptized. After these words, I felt strangely at peace, and I was quite sure that, despite the difficulties, the waters of holy baptism would be poured upon her soul. That night, when she was very low, I got out of bed three times to see her, watching for the right moment to give her this grace. The next morning she seemed to feel a little better. In the afternoon her last moment began to approach. The sister who was her nurse said that baptism would be difficult because they were with her. The moment came when the sick woman would lose, began to lose consciousness. 
and as a result, in order to save her, they began to run about. Some went to fetch the doctor, while others went off in other directions to find help. And so the patient was left alone, and sister baptized her, and before they had all rushed back, her soul was beautiful, adorned with God's grace. Her final agony began immediately, but it did not last long. It was as if she fell asleep. All of a sudden I saw her soul ascending to heaven in wondrous beauty. Oh, how beautiful is a soul with sanctifying grace! Joy flooded my heart that before this image I had received so great a grace for this soul. Oh, how great is God's mercy! Let every soul praise it. Oh, my Jesus, that soul for all eternity will be singing you a hymn of mercy. I shall not forget the impression this day has made on my soul. This is the second great grace which I have received here for souls before this image. So we see a number of things here. One is that uh, baptism works um, on its own accord, so to speak, that the operation itself contains its effect and it's independent of uh, who performs the baptism as long as the correct formula is used. And it's even independent of the will of the recipient of the baptism. Of course, one should not uh, baptize somebody actively against their will. But in this case, there was clearly no consent on the part of the baptized person. And yet, it's had its effect, um, it had its effect anyway. Um, another thing I'd like to point out is that St. Faustina, her first name is Saint. She is a saint. So it would be hard to argue that what she did was in some sense a violation or sinful or anything like that. We don't know what this Jewish woman's uh, interior disposition was, whether she was uh, anti-Christian or whether she was sympathetic to Christianity or whether she had expressed some interest in Christianity or not. Um, we, don't, we don't know that. Um, I have no idea. I suspect that St. Faustina didn't know it. St. Faustina acted out of concern for her soul, and it was effective. One could also uh, perhaps throw in the fact that Jesus clearly arranged the circumstances for her baptism. Um, it was a, a miraculous may not be the right word, but it was certainly providential that she was left alone at just the right moment to enable her to be baptized. So that suggests that um, that perhaps um, God knew something that we don't know about the appropriateness of her being baptized. But in any case, as soon as she was baptized and she almost immediately died, St. Faustina saw her soul ascending to heaven in wondrous beauty. So, um, oh, and I, I thank, I thank God for this gift that uh, was um, given to this woman through St. Faustina. And I certainly thank God for the gift of my parents' baptism. I will say that in the case of both my parents, um, there was some expressed uh, consent, let's say, to being baptized, some expressed interest in uh, Jesus and in baptism and in Christianity that preceded my baptizing them. Uh, would I have baptized them without any such? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I'm, I'm glad I didn't have to um, discern that, uh, but that, in fact, I was given the gift of having heard them express interest or consent uh, before the final moments or the moment came to baptize them. So that was my little uh, Jewish conversion story associated with St. Faustina. And um, let me uh, turn to St. Bruno. Now, St. Bruno, um, uh, he has nothing that I know of explicitly to do with the conversion of the Jews, but he has a tremendous amount to do with my conversion. Uh, when I was still Jewish and anti-Catholic, in fact, I found myself in a Carthusian monastery. The Carthusians are the order that St. Bruno founded. They are the strictest contemplative order left in the church. They uh, eat one meal a day. They live in solitary confinement. They live in very strict silence. 
they break sleep every night of their lives so that um, they sleep for about three hours until about midnight, and then they um, assemble in the chapel to chant a matins, and then they uh, go back to sleep for about another three hours before uh, it's time for a morning mass. And uh, it's a very penitential, severe, and silent and contemplative life. And um, I had had a couple of experiences, first an experience of Christ and then an experience of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So so um, I was um, very interested in pursuing those experiences, even though, as I said, I was so anti-Catholic. When I found out about the Carthusians, I made arrangements to uh, visit a Carthusian monastery. Unbeknownst to me, the only circumstance on which they let me in was because they thought I was a potential vocation. So I found myself at the Carthusian Monastery in France, a, a proudly Jewish, anti-Catholic, uh, very swelled head uh, Harvard Business School professor. And it was when I was there that I actually uh, received the grace to understand the Catholic Church, to understand the relationship between the Blessed Virgin Mary, who already had a, a great, uh, um, uh, a great attraction to and the Catholic Church, and to understand the true relationship between Judaism and the Catholic Church, which is that the Catholic Church is the continuation of Judaism after the coming of the Jewish Messiah. And I saw this in the monastery as a result of several experiences there, and um, I will recount certainly the first one. I don't know if this studio is going to be breaking in for the... um, for the fundraising appeal in a few minutes. Uh, If it is, I'll obviously interrupt the story and then continue after the uh, fundraising appeal. But um, I found myself at the monastery. I was joining them for matins every night, meaning breaking sleep from midnight to 2 or 2.30 in the morning for to chant in the the choir, in the the, um, chapel. I wouldn't chant, of course. They would chant. I would just be standing there silently. I'd be looking to my left and my right. I would be seeing all of these very earnest, uh, very often old men uh, getting up in the middle of the night every night to chant the Psalms. So they were chanting, Oh, Jerusalem, should I ever forget you? Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Oh, Zion, there's no place in the world more beautiful than you. And so forth and so on. And I would be listening to them chanting this and looking to my left and my right, and I would say to myself, these guys are all wannabe Jews, because, of course, the Psalms are drawn from the Old Testament. There are many, many, many references to Judaism and Jerusalem and Zion and so forth. And that is, of course, that was the, the core of their prayer, of their, their worship. And um, so in seeing them chant the Psalms and hearing what they were chanting, I saw that they saw themselves as the continuation of Judaism and saw, as St. Uh, John Paul II, St. Pope John Paul II said, that the Jews are our elder brothers in the faith. So that was one thing that um, opened my heart to um, the uh, um, continuation, so to speak, the, the smooth uh, transition that was actually the case between Judaism and the Catholic Church. And another thing that happened was one day I was out um, scything the grass in the orchards. That was my job there when an elderly monk shuffled out to talk to me because since they never had any opportunity to talk, sometimes they took advantage of a chance to cheat a little bit. And so he kind of shyly shuffled out to me and uh, said, "Uh, do you mind if I ask you a question? And I said, no, not at all. And he said, well, then, if you don't mind my asking, uh, you're not Catholic, are you? Because we... Notice you weren't receiving communion. And I said, no, that's right, I'm not Catholic. And then he said kind of shyly, well, then, if you don't mind my asking, what are you then? And I kind of stood up proudly and said, I'm Jewish. And his response, I apologize in a sense for his response. I don't mean to offend anybody, but this is just what he said. His response was, oh, good, that's good. We were all afraid you were Protestant. So, because, of course, he saw the Jews as the elder brothers in the faith who had not yet received the gift of the faith, whereas he saw the Protestants as people who had rebelled against the fullness of the faith. So I'm not, I'm not defending his point of view. I'm simply recounting it and saying that 
that really kind of opened the door in my head because here he was um, identifying much more closely with Jews and Judaism than he was with Protestantism, which also made me see the uh, closeness, in a sense, between the Catholic Church and Judaism. And now, if I may make a little uh, uh, comment to the studio, if you want to break in, you have my blessing. I don't know if that's your plan to break in or not. Um, uh, Okay, I will continue. So, um, I want to read uh, two things uh, from St. Bruno, so to speak. I want to read, we have very little of his writing. Um, He had a very, very, very beautiful and deep spirituality, and he really saw he really saw what was important and what wasn't important. And, uh, uh, well, really all he saw was the truth and, and the logic of the truth, which is if the Catholic faith is true, and of course it is, and we live forever, and everything about our eternity, everything about our life for the next hundreds and billions of years, hundreds of millions and billions of years, is determined by how we spend the 80 or 90 years we have on earth, then of course um, nothing that lives and dies with our time on earth has any weight at all uh, in relationship when, when weighed against its import for our eternity. And in fact, the meaning of everything between birth and death is defined by its impact on our eternity. If, in fact, the Catholic faith is true, and it is true, it doesn't make any sense to shortchange our eternity for a passing uh, satisfaction on earth. Um, I will begin by reading some meditations. They're not actually meditations of St. Bruno. They're meditations by a follower of his who became the prior of the Carthusians uh, a few decades, actually, after St. Bruno's death. Um, They reflect his spirituality. They reflect the Carthusian spirituality. And um, uh, after the break, uh, I will will read one of the few writings we have of St. Bruno, a letter that he left behind. Um, Okay, so um, I'm going to begin with what may seem like a bit of a scandalous uh, meditation. What woman is so shameless as to tell her husband, Seek out for me this or that man, so that I may sleep with him, for he pleases me more than you. If you don't, I shall not rest. Yet you do this to your husband, that is the Lord, when you, loving something besides him, make the very same request of him. In other words, um, our true husband, our true Lord, is of course Jesus, and we actually have the shamelessness to ask Jesus to help arrange for us um, something that we prefer to him that is in fact an infidelity to him. Uh, For instance, um, I'll take a a, a trite example in some sense. I mean, if we are unmarried and we pray to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend, not a future spouse, but a girlfriend or a boyfriend for the pleasure of having a girlfriend or a boyfriend, we are in exactly that situation of having the shamelessness to ask God to help us be unfaithful to him, for to ask God to be the intermediary, so to speak, the procurer for our infidelity to him himself. I hope that made sense. Um, uh, it's, I mean, all of these meditations are simply, um, uh, are, are really simply uh, uh, common sense, I think, in a sense, but they're common sense, very uncommon co- form of common sense in which we see, uh, or rather they, they reflect the true weight of everything on earth, which is its um, weight for eternity. I'll read another of these meditations. One man gave all his position, possessions for the praises of men, another man for the pleasure of his 
belly, and gullet. Which of these acted in a worse manner? That I do not know, but I do know that one acted with a pig's intent and the other with the devil's. So, um, again, what he's saying is very clear. You can look at one man who gives up everything he has for the praises of men, and you can look at another man that gives up everything he has for sensual satisfaction of, of eating and physical pleasures. Which of these is worse? That he doesn't know, but he does know that the first acted in the manner of the devil, who basically um, fell off his throne because he desired praise, and the other acted in the manner of a pig, who thinks only of um, his physical satisfaction. Um, it's, uh, these may sound uncharitable, but I'll, I'll read some more in a few moments that um, uh, make it clear that he's not at all being uncharitable. Uh, he's simply being rather blunt. Um, secular authority sets forth edicts, not consulting the benefit of men, but serving its own pleasure. And there are fear to such an extent that one would scarcely dare to violate them, even in secret. The decrees of God, however, are set forth not for his benefit, but only for our salvation, yet they are neither feared as coming from the mighty, nor loved as coming from one giving counsel, so much so that they are violated publicly, and those who violate them take glory. This is very sobering, right? The secular authorities, you know, the governments and so forth, give us laws which are not necessarily for our benefit at all, but are for their own. Uh, one can think of uh, perhaps uh, taxes or something, um, or, uh, of course, he's writing in the Middle Ages, so there was less of a sense of uh, duty on the part of secular governments to be looking after the good of the people. Although even today, of course, it's violated uh, as often as it's served. But so the secular authority gives us laws that are not necessarily to our benefit at all, of of our own at all, but only for their own. And yet we fear them so much that we would scarcely violate them, even in secret. God sets forth laws that are not at all for His benefit; they're only for our benefit. And yet they are not similarly feared. Um, nor loved as for our own benefit, um, but they are in fact violated publicly, and people boast over violating them publicly. Those who violate them take glory in violating them. So again, the uh, ridiculous uh, illogic of being afraid to violate secular authority, um, which is not necessarily for our own good, but shamelessly and uh, sometimes even boastfully violating God's authority, which is, in fact, exercised only for our own good. Um, I think what's so um, compelling about these is uh, both how obvious they are and yet how sobering they are. Um, so let me, uh, let me turn to another here. Well, this is a little bit parallel to the one I began with. When you ask God not to take away something to which you have avidly clung, it is as though a woman caught in the act of adultery by her husband, where she should ask pardon for her crime, were rather to ask him not to interrupt for her the pleasure of the adultery itself. In other words, when we are um, uh, attached to something, which is not pleasing in the eyes of God, and we ask him to not take it away from us, it is parallel to a woman who, if she was caught in the act of adultery, rather than asking forgiveness for her crime, were to ask her husband not to interrupt her because she was enjoying her crime. Um, I will uh, skip another one in the same adulterous vein, so to speak. Um, okay, this is this is more kind of neutral, just about uh, the truth of what it means to be focused entirely on things of this world. What would you think of a man who spends all his time and effort propping up a house which cannot be propped up with material and with which nothing at all can be propped, or if it could be, 
The props themselves would need as many other props as the house itself, which is to be propped up by them, and those props as many more, and so on to infinity. Is he not wretched and insane? Life is this house, you the proper, the props temporal things, which never remain in the same state, and can neither prop nor be propped at all. In other words, when we spend all our time and effort trying to uh, build up our life on earth, so to speak, it is intrinsically futile because we cannot make our life on earth permanent no matter how hard we try, and any attempt we make to um, prop up our life on this earth will itself be part of the transitoriness of this earth and be doomed to failure. Um, and yet, uh, as he says, is he not wretched and insane if he puts all his time and energy into propping up that which cannot be propped up when, in fact, we have this alternative, which is to be living for our eternal life already here in this time on earth. And with that, I think I, I usually take a, um, a short break about halfway through the show, and unfortunately... Um, we're already about halfway through the show. So with that, I will um, uh, take a short musical break. It'll be a, a monastic chant um, in, this, uh, in the kind of um, spirit of uh, St. Bruno. And when we come back, I will read the letter of St. Bruno to his friend, which is again about the insanity of trading, pleasing God for the pleasure in this world and also more of these Carthusian meditations on the same theme. So with that, let me go to the chant, and I'll be back in a few moments. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, that uh, little uh, uh, snippet of monastic chant. It was actually not from a Carthusian monastery, um, but it was from a Benedictine monastery but it captured um, some of the interiority and contemplative spirit. Anyway, you're listening to uh, Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism on Radio Maria with your host, Roy Shulman. And I am uh, kind of dedicating the show today on the Feast of St. Bruno to uh, St. Bruno, the founder of the Carthusians, and reflecting on a little bit on Carthusian uh, spirituality and um, the light that Carthusian spirituality uh, shines on the true meaning of life and the correct uh, balance, so to speak, between concerns for uh, this life between birth and death versus concerns for eternal life. And that light, I will go to um, the longest remaining letter of St. Bruno to his friend Raoul the Green, Raoul Le Verde, and... Um, Uh, Let me give a little background to this letter, which is that when they were young, before they uh, launched their careers, so to speak, they were gathered and they all took a vow together to leave the world and uh, basically become hermits to worship God in solitude and um, 24-7. And, of course, St. Bruno did this, and his friend Raoul Leverde didn't. And he uh, he became a religious, but he became a um, canon and advisor to the archbishop and so forth and remained in the world, even though in the world as a religious. And St. Bruno, at the other end of life, basically, with death on the horizon, is exhorting his friend to remember the vow he made to God when he was young and to fulfill it before it's too late. So let me, with that, turn to the letter of St. Bruno to his friend, Raoul Leverd. To my esteemed friend, Raoul, Dean of the Cathedral Chapter at Rheim, I, Bruno, send my greetings, as all my heartfelt affection toward you bids me. I am living in the wilderness of Calabria, far removed from habitation. There are some brethren with me, some of whom are very well educated, and they are keeping assiduous watch for their Lord so as to open to him at once when he knocks. I could never even begin to tell you how charming and pleasant it is. The temperatures are mild, the air is healthful, a broad plain delightful to behold, 
stretches between the mountains along their entire length, bursting with fragrant meadows and flowery fields. One could hardly describe the impression made by the gently rolling hills on all sides, with their cool and shady glens tucked away, and such an abundance of refreshing springs, brooks, and streams. Besides all this, there are verdant gardens and all sorts of fruit-bearing trees. Yet why dwell on such things as these? The man of true insight has other delights, far more useful and attractive, because divine. It is true, though, that our rather feeble nature is renewed and finds life in such perspectives, wearied by its spiritual pursuits and austere mode of life. It is like a bow which soon wears out and runs the risk of becoming useless if it is kept continually taut. In any case, what benefits and divine exaltation the silence and solitude of the desert hold in store for those who love it, only those who have experienced it can know. For here men of strong will can enter into themselves and remain there as much as they like, diligently cultivating the seeds of virtue and eating the fruits of paradise with joy. Here they can acquire the eye that wounds the bridegroom with love by the limpidity of its gaze and whose purity allows them to see God himself. Uh, let me interrupt and say, for this to make sense, one has to have a little bit of a sense of what contemplation uh, really means or, or the potential of contemplation because the potential of contemplation is actually to um, enter into a kind of illumined consciousness. These words are very dangerous because they're polluted by uh, pop mysticism and actually even polluted by occultism and so forth. But the idea is that when one reaches a certain state of purity of soul and union with God, one can, uh, to some extent, I'm tempted to say, see things through his eyes a little bit, that he sheds a special light on one's thoughts and on one's prayers and on one's interior life so that one does taste a bit of the supernatural um, while still here in the body on earth. So with that little um, interruption, let me go back to the letter. Here they can observe a busy leisure and rest in quiet activity. Here also God crowns his athletes for their stern struggle with a hope for reward, a peace unknown to the world, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Such a way of life is exemplified by Rachel, who was preferred by Jacob for her beauty, even though she bore fewer children than Leah, with her less penetrating eyes. Contemplation, to be sure, has fewer offspring than does action, yet Joseph and Benjamin were the favorites of their father. This life is the best part chosen by Mary, never to be taken away from her. It is also that extraordinary, beautiful Shunammite, the only one in Israel to take care of David and keep him warm in his old age. I could only wish, brother, that you too had such an exclusive love for her, so that lost in her embrace you burned with divine love. If only a love like this would take possession of you, immediately all the glory in the world would seem like so much dirt to you, whatever the smooth words and false attractions she offered to deceive you. Wealth and its con concomitant anxieties would cast you would cast off without a thought as a burden to the freedom of the spirit. You would want no more of pleasure either, harmful as is to both body and soul. So here St. Bruno is, um, is, is finding metaphors in uh, stories from the Bible, uh, the uh, metaphors of the relationship between the contemplative life and the active life. The first one he turns to is the story of uh, Jacob, who had two wives, Rachel and Leah, uh, Rachel, he loved more, even though she only bore him two children. Leah, who was uh, far more productive of offspring for uh, Jacob, bearing him ten, uh, had something wrong with her eyes and had less penetrating eyes. And so he sees in Rachel a model of the contemplative um, or of contemplation that sees more deeply and yet is less numerous. 
alia, a model of the active, that is more productive in an external sense, although far less penetrating. The other, of course, model of the relationship between the active and the contemplative is uh, Mary and Martha. And we know that Jesus said to Mary, she has chosen the better part because all she wanted to do was sit at his feet and adore him and hear his words, where Martha was busy with, with many things. And, in fact, Mary Magdalene is the patroness of the Carthusians for that very reason. They identify with her because they have basically dedicated their life to simply sitting at the feet of Jesus and um, listening to his words and, uh, and not taking any, any um, part in any kind of uh, visible active activity. Uh, contemplative orders have frequently been condemned, especially in the presence of kind of revolutionary movements, as being parasites, of being doing nothing of value. But nothing could be further from the truth, because, um, in fact, by devoting their life to sacrifice and prayer, they are, um, they are doing more for the world than um, could possibly be done any other way. Uh, we have many examples of that in Catholicism, and uh, one that comes to mind in the light of having talked about St. Faustina is that St. Faustina who had no active life at all, and she was just praying in her convent, um, in fact, did more to save Poland during World War II from destruction than perhaps any other single individual, certainly than any active non-religious individual. Uh, Jesus himself told her this. I'll read a couple of quotes from St. Faustina's diary before going back to St. Bruno. Um, my daughter, your confidence and love restrain my justice, and I cannot inflict punishment because you hinder me from doing so. Uh, in other words, he restrained the, uh, the damage done to Poland. Uh, Jesus said to her, quote, For your sake I bless the entire country. He also told her, quote, Let me tell you that there are but a few souls living in the world who love me dearly, they are a defense for the world before the justice of the Heavenly Father and a means of obtaining mercy for the world. The love and sacrifice of these souls sustain the world in existence. Um, again, he told her, For your sake I will withhold the hand which punishes. For your sake I will bless the earth. Again, by your entreaties, you and your companions shall obtain mercy for yourselves and for the world. So we see that it is um, completely false to say that holy contemplatives who are uh, pleasing before God and who stand between God and, in some sense, his, his just anger against the world are not doing the world any good. In fact, they're doing the world in the infinite amount of good that we cannot possibly comprehend um, uh, before we die. Uh, but in case you're interested, those uh, paragraphs I was reading from, from St. Faustina's diary were paragraph 40, paragraph 198, paragraph 367, paragraph 431, paragraph 435, and paragraph 438. So anyway... Um, uh, and that's, of course, the, the role that the, contemplative, that the Carthusians are taking. They are not contemplatives for their own sake. They're contemplatives standing uh, in a continual supplication to God for his mercy on the world. Uh, back to St. Bruno's letter. You know very well who it is that says to us, He who loves the world and the things of the world, such as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and ambition, does not have the love of the Father abiding in him, and also friendship with the world is enmity with God. What could be so evil and destructive then, so unfortunate, or so much the mark of a crazed and headstrong spirit, as to put yourself at odds with the one whose power you cannot resist and whose righteous vengeance you could never hope to escape? Surely we are not stronger than he. Surely you do not think that he will leave unpunished in the end all the affronts and contempt he receives merely because his patient solicitude now incites us to repentance. 
For what could be more perverted, more reckless, and contrary to nature and right order than to love the creature more than the creator, what passes away more than what lasts forever, or to seek rather the goods of earth rather than those of heaven? So what do you think ought to be done, dear friend? What else but to trust in the exhortation of God himself and to believe in the truth which cannot deceive? For he calls out to everyone, saying, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is it not, after all, a most ridiculous and fruitless labor to be swollen with lust, continually to be tortured with anxiety and worry, fear and sorrow for the objects of your passion? Is there any heavier burden than to have one's spirit thus cast down into the abyss from the sublime peak of its natural dignity, the veritable quintessence of right order gone wrong? Flee, my brother, from these unending miseries and disturbances. Leave the raging storms of this world for the secure and quiet harbor of the port. For you know very well what wisdom in person has to say to us. Whoever does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Who cannot perceive what a beautiful thing it is, how beneficial and how delightful besides, to remain in the school of Christ under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, there to learn that divine philosophy which alone shows the way to true happiness. Do not let the deceptive lure of riches hold you back since they cannot remedy the real poverty of our soul. Do not let your position detain you since you cannot occupy it without notable jeopardy to your spiritual life. My sincere hope, brother, is that you will not spurn the counsel of a friend nor turn a deaf ear to the words the Holy Spirit speaks. So, brother, stay in good health. Accept my ardent wish that you will take my words very much to heart. Bruno. I did skip some passages there, um, but I think that the, the, the Spirit came through. And that um, one sentence there actually seems to me to summarize the spirituality in a single sentence. What could be more perverted, more reckless, and contrary to nature and right order than to love the creature more than the creator, to love what passes away more than what lasts forever, and to seek rather the goods of earth rather than those of heaven? And that seems to me to be the whole story in a nutshell. What is sillier, more stupid, more, more blind, actually, than to love the creature rather than the creator, to, to love what passes away more than what lasts forever, and to seek the goods of the earth, which are absolutely guaranteed not to do anyone any good at all a hundred years later, or not to do us any good at all a hundred years later after we die, rather than to seek the goods of heaven which will be ours for all eternity. And that's really the, the spirit of St. Bruno that I wanted to capture here. I might add a, another clause to that, if I may, which is what is more perverse than to prefer our will over God's will. For us, uh, the creature, the created thing by God, to prefer our will, which isn't even for our own good, and even if it were for our own good, we shouldn't prefer it over our Creator's will. But as it is, it's, if we choose our will over God's will, it's not only um, unjust because He's our Creator and we have no rights independent of Him, but it's also stupid because if His will is different from our will, we can be assured that His will is better for us than our will. So it is um, both unjust and even from a self-centered viewpoint, stupid and counterproductive. Anyway, back to, oh my goodness, the time flies. Uh, back to some more quotes from uh, uh, Gigo, who was a Carthusian, as I said, who was the prior of the Carthusians a bit after uh, St. Bruno. Why do you lay more claim to yourself than to any random man or field since you have created nothing more in yourself than in them. By what right do you claim for yourself any one of those things which you have not created any more than yourself? In other words, you know, it, we, we can't take credit 
for anything in ourselves, since we did not create anything in ourselves um, more than we created anything in any random object outside of ourselves. We're not self-creators. We were created by God. Everything in us is his work. There's nothing in us that we can take pride in. The only thing that we contribute to ourselves is actually our sin. So if we were to take pride in anything because we created it, the only thing we could take pride in is, our, is in our own sin. That was my little gloss on him, but it's actually also a, a, a plagiarism from another um, Cartesian citation. Um, uh, so anyway, in that light, I will continue with these meditations. By this alone are you just, that you acknowledge and proclaim that you should be damned on account of your sins. If you say you are just, you are a liar and are condemned by the Lord, the truth as being contrary to him. Say that you are a sinner, so that speaking the truth, you may agree with the Lord, the truth, you who need liberation. Um, no matter what state we're in, even if we are a saint, actually, which I doubt that we are, any of us are, we, even saints are, are still sinners. Um, if, as soon as we stand on our own righteousness, we are actually in falsehood and are uh, incorrect in doing so and in violation of the truth, uh, the truth himself, of course, being Jesus. Um, all we can say uh, is that we are a sinner in need of the mercy of the Lord. Um, Saint um, Louis de Montfort who uh, is famous for the uh, uh, totus tuus, for the total consecration to Mary, um, which was uh, St. John Paul II's kind of favorite book that he always carried with him. Uh, on his deathbed, actually, as he was dying, his last words were, thank goodness, at least I won't sin anymore. Um, Jesus said, the truth shall set us free. And I think that's really the truth that shall set us free. It's just to see the truth of the relationship between life on earth and life in heaven, the truth between of the relationship between us and our creator, um, the truth between uh, of the relationship between us and others. Um, I don't know if I can find in time a, a, a final meditation that, that, um, that illustrates it. But um, I can't, but in any case, um, so I'll just end there. And I hope that this, uh, I don't know, this kind of dipping our toes in the water of uh, Carthusian spirituality, the spirituality of St. Bruno, um, uh, uh, is, is, uh, has been interesting, has been inspiring. I did find um, a quote that is not the perfect one, or rather a meditation that um, captures a, another dimension that I did want to mention, so I'll say it very quickly in the last minute of the show. You are set up as a target for turning back the shafts of the enemy, that is, to destroy evil by opposing it with good. Never should you render evil for evil, um, unless perhaps as medicine, and in that case you're not rendering evil for evil, but rather good for evil. Our job is to um, take evil and return good for it. That is the way that we do good in the world. If we return evil for evil, we are contributing to the evil in the world, and it's never justified. And if we respond to evil with anything resembling anger or severity, it should only be in the context of medicine, that is, to improve the situation, to, to heal the problem, in which case, in fact, we're not returning evil for evil, but we're returning good for evil. So, um, anyway, with that, it's time to leave St. Bruno and the Carthusian spirituality and a little bit of reflection on St. Faustina also. You've been listening to Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism on Radio Maria with me, your host, Roy Shulman. I hope it's been worthwhile, and I hope you join us again next week, same time, same place. Bye for now.